Hello and welcome to the Apostolic Pentecostal Church channel. The 2024 iGrow season has arrived and we are thrilled to have you with us. At APC, we have amazing teachers ready to share the joy of the gospel. If today's lesson resonates with you, spread the love by sharing this episode with a friend or on your socials. Dive deeper into our community at theapc.org or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Now, grab your favorite latte and let's dive into the lesson together. And obviously, uh, this letter was written to the churches, churches in Galatia, a territory in the central plateau of Asia Minor. Um, so why did Paul feel the need to write this letter? See, there was some false teachers called Judaizers. And the, the, what a Judaizer is, it's a Jew trying to convert Gentile Christians to following the law. And that's exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to get all the Jews to circumcise, circumcise them all. That was like their main focus, and then follow the law after that. And Paul takes a lot of time to refute this doctrine that they're pushing. And some key themes we find in Galatians, um, law and grace, flesh and spirit, and justification by faith. <clears throat> so going into chapter 1, um, just to give everyone kind of a brief idea of how I'm going to go about this, um, we're just going to go through the book of Galatians and just pick up a lot of what he's teaching. Obviously, we can't get everything, um, but I'm going to do my best to give you the condensed version. And then at the end, uh, we're going to discuss some key points that I felt stuck out to me as I did my studying for this lesson. So in chapter one, <clears throat> after a short greeting, Paul cuts right to the chase, explaining his surprise that they were falling for these Judaizers' teachings. In Galatians 1, 6 and 9, 6 through 9, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there are some that trouble you and would pervert or deliberately twist the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we said, there, said before, so I now say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. Paul did not mince words. He starts off this letter with a very strong stance. And also a little side note, I am using a few different uh, translations tonight, and it will be noted at the top. I'm not going to take the time to list what translation it is. You just have to read it on the screen. So evidently, these Judaizers were defaming Paul, trying to destroy his reputation by attacking his teachings and his authority. Because Paul goes on to explain how he received the gospel in the first place, and then he goes on to defend his calling. In verse 10, he says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? Am I doing all this just to gain a following, or am I doing this for God? For if I yet pleased men, if it was my goal to please them, should I not be the servant of Christ? But I, I should not be the servant of Christ. That's not a question. It's a statement. I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He received this gospel from Jesus himself. Not another preacher, not even the apostles. Now, I do want to clarify, he did receive the message of salvation from a preacher, but the gospel he received about Jesus, he got directly from him. He further explains to them that he didn't even meet the apostles until years after his conversion. <clears throat> Continuing from chapter 1 and moving into chapter 2, Paul describes when he went to Jerusalem for a conference with church leadership. Paul's goal at this conference was to make sure that they were all teaching the same thing. That was the main goal he wanted out of this. Uh, he says in Galatians 2 and 2, I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. While I was there, I met privately with those considered to be leaders of the church and shared with them the message I had been preaching to the Gentiles. And I wanted to make sure that we were all in agreement for fear that all my efforts had been wasted and I was running the race in vain. We're in the race for nothing. 
Paul also mentions uh, false brethren that were in, infiltrating this conference. In verse 4, he says, My concern was because of the false brothers, those, mas- those people masquerading as Christians who had been secretly smuggled into the community of believers. They had slipped in to spy on the freedom which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us back into bondage under the law of Moses. But we did not yield to them even for a moment. So if the truth of the gospel would continue to remain with you in its purity. They also concluded at this conference that Paul was, he was one entrusted to minister to the Gentiles, whereas Peter was entrusted to minister unto the Jews. And they extended to him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. At a later point in time, Paul notes that he openly confronted Peter for acting hypocritical. This, this was sometime after Peter's revelation about the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, the story of Cornelius. We find him eating with and enjoying fellowship with the Gentiles. But Paul notes that when some high-ranking Jews from the church in Jerusalem came up to Antioch, Peter withdrew from fellowship with the Gentiles. So what message did this send to the Gentiles? Maybe they saw themselves as no longer good enough. Or was it showing them that the Jews and Gentiles, they weren't on the same level? That the Jews were somehow better than them? And if they were better, did they need to follow the law as the Jews were known to do? In verse 14 of Galatians 2, Paul says, But when I saw they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Peter, you are living in freedom, free from having to follow the law. But your actions are showing the Gentiles that if they are to be accepted, they need to follow after the law. He continues in verse 16, saying, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no man be justified. Peter, you know this. You need to stop acting in such a way that casts doubt on that. Hold on one moment. Let's take a swig of water. Paul then, in chapter 3, he calls the Galatians foolish and asks them if they had received the Holy Ghost through faith or by works. In verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you had heard about Christ. Or as the King James puts it, by the hearing of faith. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Paul highlights faith as the key factor in becoming right in God's eyes. Going all the way back to Abraham in verse 6. I guess I am missing that on the PowerPoint. I apologize. It says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Paul then points out the curse of not perfectly following the law and the need to live by faith. In verse 10, he says, But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Or as the King James puts it, the just shall live by faith. 
This way of faith is very different from the way of the law, which says it is through the obeying the law that a person has life. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. <coughs> Paul explains that the covenant made with Abraham could not be annulled by the law and goes on to explain the purpose of the law. In verse 17, he says, This is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham by promise. Why then was the law given? What was its purpose? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. <clears throat> Paul states that if the law gave life, then we could obtain righteousness by it. But it actually does the exact opposite. It concludes that we are all under the curse of sin, which is death. But the scripture shows, shows us that the promise, the promise being accounted as righteous by faith of Jesus Christ, might be given to them that believe. Paul explains the purpose of the law in another way in verse 23. It says, Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now if the way of faith was, has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. Instead of guardian, the King James uses the word schoolmaster. And the Greek word for this term is pedagogos, or pedagogue. A pedagogue's task was not to teach children, but it was tasked with leading children to school and to govern their behavior. So Paul was essentially saying that the law was a pedagogue whose task it was to lead God's children to Christ. And now that we have Christ, we no longer have a need to follow the law. And Paul describes what faith does in verse 26. It says, for ye, are, for ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When you place your faith in Jesus, when you obey the gospel by faith, you become a child of God. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. There aren't multiple classifications of God's children. There isn't Jew or Gentile in God's kingdom. Jews aren't better than Gentiles, and Gentiles aren't better than Jews. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Moving into chapter 4, Paul explains that if we are children of God, then we are heirs. And if we are heirs, then that means we will have an inheritance. But heirs, when they're still children, are no different from a servant in that they do not have access to the inheritance until the time that is appointed by the Father. Paul says that when we were children, before Jesus, we were in bondage under the elements of this world. And then Paul explains that the time appointed of the Father was when Jesus came into the world. In verse 4, he says, But when the fullness of the time was come, at just the right time, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, 
that we might receive the adoption of sons, so that he could adopt us as his children. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, let's take a little bit of a detour. We're going to jump over to Romans 8 and 15. <clears throat> Paul, he repeats this and says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. In the original text, Paul uses both the Hebrew and Greek terms for uh, father, Abba, Pater. So he's basically saying, Father, Father, in two different languages. Why? Just kind of like a little side note. One theory is that it is a reference to speaking in tongues. That when we are filled with the Holy Ghost, we cry out to God in another tongue, claiming him as our father. Another theory is that it speaks to the unique constitution of the church that is comprised of both Jew and Gentile. That the Spirit speaks the language of of diversity and unity. I personally think either theory works or both. (laughs) And in the next verse, in verse 16, Paul states that the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Paul is saying, both here in Romans and in Galatians, that our adoption is made clear. It is confirmed when we are filled with the Holy Ghost. Back to Galatians 4, and in verse 7, he says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Continuing to verse 9, He says, so now that you know God, or should I say, now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? You are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. Why are you wanting to return to a system of human efforts to try and gain favor with God? I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. Paul then questions why they turned on him and his teaching when they originally received him as an angel of God. And Paul knows that it's these Judaizers who are trying to turn the Galatians against him. And he warns them of these false teachers' motives. He says in verse 16, Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over but for no good. Another translation says it this way, those heretical teachers go to great lengths to flatter you, but their motives are rotten. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. Basically what he's saying is that these false teachers are just trying to gain a following so that they may feel important. In another effort to get the Galatians to realize the foolishness of trying to live under the law, Paul gives an allegorical teaching of Hagar and Sarah. He says that Hagar represents Mount Sinai, representing the law. And he says that Abraham's son, through Hagar, was born after the flesh, or born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. Whereas Abraham's son, through Sarah, was born by supernatural means, so fulfilling God's promise. In verse 28, he says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Ishmael, the one that was born after the flesh, mocked Isaac, the son of the promise. Paul is saying that the that Ishmael's persecution of Isaac reflected the Jews' persecution of the Christians or the church. Those who had received the promise of the Holy Ghost were now being persecuted by those still trying to obtain righteousness through works. Moving into chapter 5, Paul admonishes them to stick with the liberty wherewith Christ set us free. He tells them that if they are trying to get right with God by being circumcised, then they become debtors to the entire law. 
He goes on to say that if we are trying to be justified by the law or by our own efforts, we are no longer living in grace. Verse 6 says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith with which worketh by love. The New Living Translation translates that last part like this. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. The Galatians were trying to gain favor with God by works. He had already told them several times that this effort was futile. We cannot be saved by our own works. But then, on the other hand, we have James saying faith without works is dead. And Paul wasn't contradicting James. What he was saying is that you cannot earn salvation through works. But when you have genuine faith, it is going to be expressed in acts of love. And he says as much a few verses later in verse 13. It says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. <clears throat> and then backing up to verse 7. Paul questions them again. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And the Passion, passion Translation translates verse 9 as, Don't you know that when you allow even a little lie into your heart, it can permeate your entire belief system? Paul is telling them that they cannot give place to this false doctrine, even a little bit. They need to remove it before it contaminates the faith of the whole church. In the next verse, he expresses to them that he is confident, however, that they won't continue down this path of false doctrine. And he tells them that, that whoever the teacher is, he will be judged for it. He actually says that if they want to keep, keep on preaching circumcision, then they might as well as go the rest of the way and castrate themselves. Paul certainly did not hold back how he felt about this teacher. In verse 16, says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. We are made alive when we are filled with the Holy Ghost. But just because you have the Spirit, doesn't mean you are walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit means that you are intentionally living for Him, remaining steadfast in prayer and in the reading of His Word allowing Him to lead your thoughts and your actions, and not allowing your fleshly, carnal desires to guide you. When we are being led of His Spirit, we are no longer under the law, but under the law of the Spirit. Now, going back to Romans, in chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death, it refers to the law of Moses in that it concluded all under sin. And since we are all convicted sinners, the wages or the result of sin is death. But when we are filled with and walk in the Spirit, we are living under the law of the Spirit. Living under the law of the Spirit enables us to be overcomers, to overcome sin, to overcome the flesh, because we are living in His grace. But even though we have been filled with His Spirit, so long as we have this flesh, we'll have to constantly battle His desires. In verse 5 of Romans 8, Paul says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature, or the flesh, think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, 
think about the things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. When we have His Spirit residing in us, we have power through His Spirit to overcome the desires and the temptations of the flesh. But it isn't instantaneous. It requires us us to be intentional about how we live our lives and what we allow in our lives. Paul then lists off some examples of what allowing the flesh to control you leads to. In verse 9, 19, he says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have said before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Living in the flesh, following after our carnal desires, may provide pleasure, but it's only for a season. The road of fleshly living only gets darker and darker the further you go down it. And ultimately, it will lead to eternal damnation. Eternity without Jesus. But on the flip side of that, Paul lists off what the Holy Ghost produces in the lives of the believer. In verse 22, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, or self-control. Against such there is no law. Another translation interprets that last part as legalism is helpless in bringing this about. Strictly adhering to the law will not produce this fruit. It comes as a result of being filled with the Holy Ghost and walking in His Spirit. And then in verse 24, it says, They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Moving into chapter 6, he starts off with some guidance. He says in verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any sin... You who are spiritual, that is, you who are responsive to the guidance of the Spirit, are to restore such a person in the spirit of gentleness, not with a sense of superiority or self-righteousness, keeping a watchful eye on yourself so that you are not tempted as well. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ, that is, the law of Christian love. For if anyone thinks that he is something special when, he, when in fact he is nothing special except in his own eyes, he deceives himself. But each one must carefully scrutinize his own work, examining his actions, attitudes, behavior, and then he can have the personal satisfaction and inner joy of doing something commendable without comparing himself to another. For every person will have to bear with patience his own burden of faults and shortcomings for which he alone is responsible. As Christians, we are called to love. We are called to love the lost. We are called to love our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Being a part of the body of Christ means that we serve and look after one another. And as the body of Christ, we ought not to compare ourselves to each other. When we do that, it only breeds jealousy, pride, and resentment. We need to stop criticizing others 
and instead criticize our own work and focus on how we can improve. Paul goes into more detail about the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he points out that each member of the body of Christ has their own role to play. We need to focus on what we are called to do as individuals and how that contributes to the kingdom as a whole. I wish that I could sing. (laughs) But it is useless to become jealous of someone who can sing and let that negatively affect my attitude. What I need to do in my role in the body of Christ is to do it with all of my might. On the other side of this, we should not lift ourselves up in pride in whatever role we take part in the body. Some people in the kingdom have less glamorous roles. They are behind the scenes serving the kingdom, and they may only be the nose hairs of the body, but their role is still important. And then you have the people who are front and center, the nose, if you will, when in the spotlight it can be easy to fall into a sense of self-importance, lifting up oneself in their own eyes. After this, Paul warns the Galatians to be careful about what they sow. That if we sow to the flesh, if we allow carnal things to have a foothold in our lives, if we behave carnally and pursue fleshly desires, it will only lead to corruption. So he admonishes them to sow to the Spirit, to pursue the things of God, to be kingdom-minded, and to do good to others. And then we will reap everlasting life. You can't go wrong when you are doing your best to live for God. He tells the Galatians that they should not be weary in their well-doing. Pursuing God and serving His kingdom can be hard sometimes, but we should never give up. As part of his closing remarks, Paul highlights the false teacher's hypocrisy. In verse 12, He says, those who want to make a good impression in public before the Jews try to compel you to be circumcised, just so they will escape being persecuted for faithfulness to the cross of Christ. For even the circumcised Jews do not really keep the law, but they want to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh, that is, in the fact that they have convinced you to be circumcised. But far be it for me to boast in anything or anyone, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything of any importance, nor uncircumcision, but only a new creation, which is the result of a new birth, a spiritual transformation, a new nature in Christ Jesus. We should only boast, we should only glory in the cross, We should never lift ourselves up in pride like these Judaizers were doing. We shouldn't see ourselves as someone of importance when we are really nothing. We ought to give him all the glory because it is by his blood that was shed on the cross that we have any chance of living this spirit-filled, overcoming life. Um, A little side note. I don't know how well this goes with that little last part, but I watched a a snippet of a sermon last night. Uh, It was Jack Cunningham. Some of you know who he is. He was preaching, um, and he was saying when he was a young man, when he was basically like an apprentice to Billy Cole, they went to some conference, and Billy Cole, like on their way, it was a Presbyterian conference, and on their way there, like everything was planned, like Billy Cole was the one invited to preach. But a few minutes away from the church, Billy Cole turns to him, you're preaching tonight. <laughs> that's, that's pretty terrifying, but I mean, he, he did what he was told, and he, and he preached. And um, I mean, it was still fantastic. Over 50 people got the Holy Ghost that night. Amazing. And, but on the car ride, so they had like a, a taxi driver or something, and then Jack Cunningham was in the front. Um, sorry, Billy Cole was in the front, Jack Cunningham was in the back seat. And then he was telling him, Brother Cole, I am so sorry. I did terrible I preached terribly. And Billy Cole spun around and rebuked him. So anyone who is willing to take the credit when something goes wrong, 
will take the credit when things go right. So in everything, we give God the glory. And when we slip and fall, move on. So, as we have gone through the book of Galatians, I hope that you have learned something. But this is, I grow. So how do we grow from what we have studied in Galatians? How can I apply this to my life? The book of Galatians is rich, and it's deep. There's a lot of things that we can take away from it. But as I was studying this book, there were two main points that stuck out to me that I wanted to focus on. And the first is simply that we should walk in the Spirit. As we already discussed, walking in the Spirit is intentionally living for God and serving His kingdom. There is the flesh and there is the Spirit. And we cannot serve both our fleshly desires and the Spirit. If you are someone who is trying to do that, to live in both worlds, you are only setting yourself up for failure. It's like you're walking down the right path, but you keep putting stumbling blocks in your way. You're not going to get very far. Walking in the Spirit means putting away things that would keep you from getting closer to God. I have some things in my life that God impressed upon me to give up. These were things that, unless I was putting it before God, wasn't necessarily sin. <coughs> These things still please my flesh. I felt like God was telling me that the more we seek to please our flesh, the harder it is to walk in His Spirit, to pursue Him, even to connect with Him. And I'll go ahead and share um, that instance. It was a few years ago. And God was dealing with me heavily about my movie collection. I didn't have a huge, massive collection, but I was, I was proud of it. I'm like, I was building it up, you know, I had all these great movies. Now, I was, I was working on cleaning them from, like, my backslid life. I was getting rid of some, like, not appropriate movies, you know. But then I felt God tell me, okay, now get rid of the rest of it. I didn't, I didn't like that. <laughs> In my backslid years... Um, I fancied myself a movie critic. I love going to the theater. I love watching movies, reviewing them. I would put all the reviews in my iPad. And obviously, I didn't let anyone else read it. It was just for me. But, <laughs> but it was something I very much enjoyed. And I like to go through these movies and rewatch all the ones I really liked. And I'm like, it wasn't sin. I wasn't putting it before God. But God brought this scripture to my mind. And I'm probably going to butcher the quotation. But... Um, if you, I'm not even going to try and quote it. He says that the people who have the love for the things of the world do not have the love of God in them. And that convicted me. They also said, like, when, when you come to God, you've got to count the cost. And that means putting away things in the flesh. Putting away things that are going to inhibit your walk with Him. The more you prioritize the Spirit the deeper you're going to go in His Spirit. I've listened to a lot of sermons over the years. Great preachers, Jeff Arnold, Lee Stone King, Josh Herring, Joey Campitella, the list goes on and on. And they always tell us of all these different um, experiences they had, these deep spiritual things um, where God like showed them a vision of heaven or something, something dramatic and amazing. And I want that. But I don't have their consecration. If I live the way they do, maybe one day I'll get to see those kind of things. I'm hoping I will. But i got to put the fleshly things away. And I need to walk in the Spirit as best I can, putting away those things. <clears throat> Walking in the Spirit means less of us and more of Him. We must make ourselves decrease and allow Him to increase in our lives. And the second thing is that we need to embrace His grace. See what I did there? Grace means unmerited favor. He pours out His favor upon us because He loves us unconditionally. We simply cannot earn His favor and His love for us. And this may come more easily to some, but we need to learn to accept His love for us. We may know that He loves us, 
because that's what his word says. But we haven't truly internalized it. We haven't embraced it in our hearts. In the story of the prodigal son, the son took his inheritance and left his father to live how he saw fit. He was living in a life of sin. He spent all of his inheritance on pleasing his flesh and eventually led him to a filthy pig pen eating their food. And one day he has this realization that while he is starving, there are servants in his father's house that to eat, get to eat their fill of food and still have food left over. He decides that he's going to go back to his father. He's going to confess that he had sinned and that he is no longer worthy to be called his son. But he was going to ask his father to make him as one of the hired servants so that he could earn his food. But when the father sees his son afar off, what does he do? Is he angry that his son is trying to come back? After wasting his inheritance, after dishonoring him, to ask for your inheritance before the father had passed was a huge sign of disrespect. I mean, it's disrespectful in today's age. It's even more disrespectful back then. He ought to said, you got some nerve coming back here, boy. He had every right to be upset. But that's not what he does. As soon as he sees his son, he runs to him and he embraces him. He is, he's so happy to have his son back. His son makes his offer to become a servant. And you know what his father does? Doesn't even acknowledge it. He says, bring out the best robe. Put a ring on his hand. My son is back and we're going to celebrate. That's how Jesus is with us. When we sin, when we've done him wrong, when we are too ashamed to even come before him in prayer, there are some of us who may feel the need in those moments. When we've done him wrong, we may feel the need to earn back his favor, to earn back his love. But he just wants us to come back to him. 1 John 1 and 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I feel most Christians might go through this phase at one point, one point or another where they just don't feel worthy. I mean, you're not worthy, but like when we sin, we just beat ourselves up. And I was at that point at one point, and I just had to recite the scripture over and over and over again until it really instilled into my spirit. He's faithful, and he's just to forgive us our sins. If you are a parent, you get a glimpse into what his love is like for us. And let's say one of my children was playing with fire and burned the house down. I can tell you with 100% certainty that I will not hold it against my child. I will forgive and I will love my child. The Galatians were trying to earn God's favor by being circumcised and to follow the law. Remember that Paul told them that they were adopted by God when they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And if they were now children of God, there was no need to earn his favor. If we are filled with the Holy Ghost, we've been adopted by God. We are his children. We don't seek to earn his favor. He pours it out on us in abundance. There are some of us who need to have a revelation of what it means to be a son or a daughter of God. I love my kids. I wouldn't hold anything against them, and I would do anything for them. And if I love my kids that much... How much more does God love me? He already gave his life for me when he hung on that cross. He loves us in such a way that we will never be able to fully comprehend it. We just need to accept that he loves us that much. So while we cannot earn his love or his favor, good works are a natural result of walking in the Spirit, but trying to earn his favor with our, with our own efforts will get us nowhere. And it will only lead us into self-condemnation. It will lead to an I'm not good enough mentality. And that's right. You're not good enough. He is. He loves you. 
His grace is sufficient for you. I just want to give like another example of my life. This is something I've overcome. This is not something I'm currently going through. But when I had come back into church a few years ago, I was faithfully attending church. One thing that convicted me was this food pantry. I, every day I'd pass by the, every Saturday I'd pass by the church on my way to work. Um, I see that line. It was during COVID, that line would be all the way around. It was backed up pretty far. And I just, God would convict me to serve. And I did. I started serving. Um, and I worked like every Saturday for like a year or two. I was, I, I loved it. And, but it got to a point where I was like, I wasn't doing enough. I felt like I had to earn his love. I, had, I feel like I had to earn the presence of God, so to speak. So Friday nights, I'd come in here. Neil said he needed someone to clean the pantry, so I'd come in Friday nights, and I would clean. I'd be on my hands and knees cleaning baseboards. And my motive, though, was to earn his favor. When he already had it for me. That's something that I had to realize a bit later, but... We need to embrace His grace. To really embrace His love and grace is to show God that you trust in Him. When Abraham trusted in God, he accounted it to Him for righteousness. We can shout, we can jump, we can dance for Him, but trust is the highest form of praise. God says He's going to do something, Believe him. And he's going to be so happy. Hey, hey, they believe me. They believe my word. He's going to be excited about that. He's going to honor you. He's going to honor your faith in him. So, with that, I don't have anything else to add. So, um, let's go ahead and close in prayer. We are all done a little bit early, but let's go ahead and close in prayer that God would help us to walk in his spirit and to truly embrace his grace and love for us. Jesus, Lord, I thank you again for this time to gather together and to study your word. I pray that you have helped each and every one of us in some way or another. I pray that your word